So after the first year, I decided we need a written contract. Um, so now I'm people responsible for what? Uh, we're going to change a lot of things. So we, we, we got a contract, spelling that out. Um, when you're going to contract raise, you need to figure out how you're going to get paid. Um, is it going to be per head per day? Is it going to be per pound a game? Uh, is it going to be a monthly charge? Um, you have to figure all that out. When I was trying to find a written contract, there's a website from Acura. It's very useful. A lot of information about contracting, but also about passion too. Um, so we wrote our first contract. Um, and I'll get into this a couple slides later in more detail, but um, like I said, we tried to spell stuff out to find you know, what was going to happen if this happened, what happened, if that didn't happen. So my started research is there some items to consider. Um, and the first one dealt with the dairy farmer himself. The second highest feed cost on a dairy farm is feeding and raising the average. What's the first first thing? It's the highest cost on a dairy farm. It's feeding the cows. Okay? The problem is the dairy farmers don't realize this. Okay? So you can go and drop a figure of you know a dollar seventy five per every day in front of them, they fall over. Okay? So the first thing I'd say if you're looking at doing this is have that farmer sit down and calculate what it cost him to raise his average. That will open their eyes up. Okay, they have no idea what it costs to raise their average. They totally concentrate on the average. So have them do that, and uh, that will help you when you start to do the price. Um, again, are you going to do it just in the summer, or is it going to be year-round? That's something to consider, and consider that in your, your charging. Um, Here's one, the size of heifers and crew. Are you getting in wet calves? You know, you're gonna start rock feeding calves, it takes a lot of time. And that's also where you have your hires for power and that's from you know, day old up to get a lean. Um, so if you're gonna do that, charge accordingly. I would strongly advise not to get into that part of it. Okay. I like to get them when they're lean. We try to group from lean to 400, 403. Green usually happens around 14 to 15 months old. Then they're running with another group of bred heifers. Um, number of herds. You know, in my case, I'm dealing with two guys right now. One time I had three. You know, biosecurity is an issue. You know, farmer A has this herd, farmer B has this herd. We're ready to get on my farm. Um, there's different issues. When I started, Neither farmer is dealing with vaccinated or anything. Um, we have we have a black leg, black leg. I got black leg out of the soil, um, so we have to vaccinate for that. So when you're going to do this, you know, think about that. Um, it's real convenient to run as few herds as possible. When you start growing this, if you have Weighing 400 pounds, you have 400 breeding, and you have breeding up, and you have you know, Farmer Joe's herd, you have Farmer Jane's herd. Pretty soon you're managing six groups of cows in the pack. And trying to see where they're going and going to be in 30 days is impossible. Okay? So I recommend trying to keep those groups down. What I try to do when we bring groups of heifers in, they hit the barn. Some of them stay in the barn because some of these now are all these people on the only that they've never seen that defense. It's a whole other challenge. But bring them in, let them in the barn, settle down. The next day we vaccinate. I try to keep them separate for two weeks and we'll work in with everybody else. Uh, so far it's been working with new train tracks. So we wrote the contract, we had to think about things, trucking. Salt minerals, supplemental feed, green, bed cost, mortality, uh, facilities, grazing season, performance or lack of performance. You know, these guys are paying me good money to raise their heifers. They want to see performance. So we, we came up with some weights and target ages. Payment, and probably more important from my end, what happens when there's no payment or late payment. 
Animal ID is very important because if you've got two or three different guys numbers in there, you got to know who belongs to who. Um, insurance and obviously the organic part. So today, our operation, we've evolved um, since 2000. We original farm 55 acres, about 45 still in the pasture. Um, last year, I purchased part of my mother's home place six miles down the road. So that had another 52 acres, 26 total in the operation. And as of right now, we were in addition to 92 acres, 16 of that is adjacent to the home farm, so I have that fenced in. And we raise that. We try to focus on the grazing. But what happens with the pasturing, some of you probably realize this, is you know, I didn't like having no control or hay harvest, so I went all hay for them. And now we can make hay with one, two, and I can stay to his path so I can the, the grass. The pasture starts to wear out, so I started to receive pasture, so I'm going to start barring equipment while farming. So the equipment is about the same with barring hay equipment, because then contractors and everything to do it, so we bought it for one, tell you what. <laughs> and along with that, we bought the combine, and we bought the corn pair. Um, by going organic, um, we try to you know, produce wheat, still oats, beans, and corn. As part of this is kind of the first part of the operation. Um, if I was going to conventionally, I wouldn't do it, I'd lose my butt. But we have a real good market locally for all those products. And for organic beans this year, I got $24 a month. And we got 48 bushels of the acre. I'm real tempted to get out of the operation. <laughs> but that's not sustainable. You know, in an organic world, you've got to irrigate those crops through. Um, so that's why we have all these different mechanisms to do that. Um, today, like I said, we're with two different dairies. We also start organic beef herd, just to diversify. And uh, we do a handful of feeder pigs and some chickens. It didn't take me long to realize. I'm getting older and slowing down and not like I used to be and right here is my future. So I try to incorporate them in the operation as much as I can. Um, when they turn a couple years old, they each got a cow and a calf. And Tyler here, he's all about building equity. And he now has eight cows and calves in the herd. My daughter here, she's all about the lower in the back pocket. She's up to two. <laughs> As soon as they're old enough to sell, they're gone. That's the difference between both of them. Um, but now, like I said, we want to grow in a sustainable operation. And grab my mind into the future, um, what we'll happened positive impacts along the way. So, back to the contract. And uh, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, the best way to do it. But again, this is what we do. I try to spell out what's happened. Um, he's bringing 20 heifers in this year, uh, about this size. Um, they kind of get you know, those 20 heifers back as they, they crush them. And I try to keep a hold of that because if you don't, what happens is they come, they, they pick up their 20 and then they don't tell you that you want the you know, 40, okay? And you have your system set up for 20 and now they give you 40. All right, so I try to spell out what's coming in and what's going out. Uh, here's come the performance goals. You know, they want a certain size by a certain time period. If I don't meet that, it's so on me. We adjust things. If I meet that, then everything's happy. The vaccination program, like I said, originally I left them in charge of that. That was a disaster. So now I'm in charge of that. I got with my vet. He spelled out a program. And like I said, we vaccinate everything. As soon as it gets off the trail, it will settle down for a day. The stress level goes down. We vaccinate. Follow. If you're there for a year, we'll follow up with yearly updates. Um, worming, you know, we do do some worming. It's organic now, so it's not like we can use what we can use out of the if we need to, but we don't. Um, worming is a very important part. We have to check people counts, and I think that's a good thing to do. So you know we use the parasite mode in your house. Um, Talk about breeding, who's responsible for that, how that's going to happen. Um, this is sort of the, 
the liability here, like I said, if an animal gets sick, I try to treat it, and it doesn't work, um, it's not on me. Um, we need a vet, I have the ability to call the vet, and the vet can start treatments. If it's a major thing, if the pepper needs an operation, I call the farmer, he makes decisions. He's paying the vet bill. If I had to pay the vet bill, I'd add more than my charge. Um, just a clause down here by the side about the razor heifers. I don't think it's fair that I can call the farms to get your heifers out of here so we work on four week minutes. If I want them out there, I get four weeks notice. Same back for me. Um, only responsibilities, I want them to provide the NYD because they're only going back to their herds and stick with their system. Rather than cutting your tags out and tagging, I use their system. Um, Basically more liability stuff, um, four weeks. And here we talk about the vet bill and breeding, it's say I. They tell them what they want to use, set it up with you know, goats like cyrogenics who they want to use. And I take care of getting the bread. And uh, talk a little bit more about that, how we do that. This is the vaccination program. Basically, it's a $10 per head charge to get into my barn. That covered the vaccination for one round. Um, I'm going to spell out the payment for it per day. And down here I talk about what happens if we don't get paid. A lot of things and tools you have, and you know, I strongly recommend you use if you get a bill assignment. That's when the farmer gets paid, the bank, that money comes right out of their account, right to you. Um, that way you know you're going to get paid. I strongly recommend that. Um, and down here, the way I after 120 days, um, I reserve the right to hold the heifers and not send them back to the dairy if I'm not paying them for um, And that's very important, you know. I talk a lot of people do this, and that bill can snowball fast. If they don't pay for one month, it's not bad. Two months before you know that you're $15,000 out on one guy. And uh, you have no money coming in. It. Money going out, we really affect your operation. So, have provisions for that. I'm a long time. We're good? Okay. How did I start again? I was asked to go to New York about 2005 or so to give a talk to some farmers up in upstate New York. Took my buddy Richard Stall along, who's a grazer in Somerset, he was about 90 jerseys. We went up there and ran into Peter Small and White with Horizon. He told us we should be organic. He gave us a hundred reasons why. Um, it's a nine hour drive home. So the time we got home, Richard was ready for organic. I wasn't sold. Um, I raised his effort, so I had to make a decision whether I was going to go organic or find something else to raise efforts for. I looked into organic and decided it was a lot of money to just throw up my ground for 30 hours. So what we did at that point is he certified my ground in his name for his hours. And that worked out pretty good, okay? During that time period, we finally got a vacation with Mountain Axe Head. And whenever you go to Somerset the Giant Eagle, that's where I'm from, Somerset, you walk in the grocery store, there's 15 rows of food. The organic section is about this big on one row, okay? I went down to the Axe Head, walked in the grocery store, there's 15 rows. Eight of those rows were organic. And people were buying that stuff up and right. It was nuts, okay? So they go, oh man, maybe there is a market for this. So, talking to Richard when I got back, you know, he's saying that everybody's calling him one of the organic bailies, one of the corn, this and that. So we saw a need for it and we decided to jump into organic. Another tool you have as an effort raiser in the organic world is bring the livestock if they're organic must get 30% of the drive back from the pasture for 120 days a year. Now that's not a lot. Okay? But you'd be surprised how many dairies don't have pasture available for heifers to meet that goal. Okay? I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do. It's a good position to be in. Okay? When we transitioned, um, all our home ground went right away because we never used 
use any chemical fertilizers. We use chicken litter. Some of the rank ground have these transition, and the transition is three years. It has to be uh, chemical free, um, for uh, commercial fertilizer free, but anything synthetic you can't be a farm. So we transitioned to the other ground. I had the bee first, we started bringing them in. Um, if the cows were never bred or treated organically, the cows would be organic. Okay, the cows will never be the cows will be. So we started the, the bee first transition as well. Um, like I said, today, with the dairy efforts, I had one guy who worked with, or someone mentioned before, earlier before we started buying and selling. I actually inherited the efforts because he didn't pay the bill. Um, and then I sold them back to him, but he could never catch up, so I sold them somewhere else. Um, I don't prefer that method, but it, it got me out of the pocket. So mainly now we're in this one right here, we're raising year around on a per day per day basis. Uh, but like I said, this, this right here, right here is where you make money. Okay? That's the current farm layout. And mainly all these fences you see are permanent. There's some polywires in here. But then we take we polywire our area. Just to give you an idea, these are already only about an acre and a half in size, and we break them down two or three times. Um, right now, we do peppers every day. Every day, they see new grass. And I like to use an analogy when I give talks about this. You know, let's say we fill a buffet bar and we stuff the buffet on Monday for the whole week. Okay? So, Monday and Tuesday, we're going to go to the great steak and potatoes. By Saturday, it's time to bring the cheese and bacon bits. Okay? So what's our daily eating going to be on Monday compared to Saturday? Okay. Same thing. You give animals a big area, they're going to eat good stuff first, and then also good stuff last. You're going to see daily gains going like this. You get to a short rotation, you kind of take that out. Um, when I was born this a number of years ago, we ran the trucks in and out across the scales. I don't have last box scales, but we were right at two pounds per right, per day on straight grass. Okay, so organically now, what's my challenge is getting paid. You notice I just said it once to three times. Okay, it's gotten better. Uh, organic dairy farmers definitely are doing better than the conventional farmer. Um, anybody know what the conventional milk is right now? I have a book. It was around 16, 17. Richard, the guy I raised for, was getting 41. So they, that's what the matter of fact and everything else, but he's doing very well. Health is a challenge. You've got to be proactive. If you see an animal and think she's sick, if you wait 12 hours, it's too late. You see him breathing hard, not acting right, you got to get on the floor right away. The homeopathic stuff will work. Wintertime, I probably use double the pay of everybody else in Somerset County. But what I found the dairy heifers like to keep them clean and dry, we don't have issues. If they get wet and dirty, we have issues. I'm sure like down here, we're up Mount Davis, it's six miles from me, it's the highest point in Pennsylvania, so we get a lot of winter. Um, the dairy heifers like to be in the barn, we go in and out. The beef cattle just, they have the option to go in and out, they're, they're out. A lot more hardy animals they have. Uh, as far as grain, I don't like to feed grain because I can sell for a lot of money. Uh, but I found that we don't feed grain up to three to 12 months old, we have issues. So once we hit 12 months old, we jerk it. As long as we have good baleage. Uh, we jerk that out and just feed straight, straight baleage. Fly control was a real issue uh, two years ago. I treated 38 cases of pink eye. That's all we did all summer long. I was talking to some people that said, try this product, so I tried it. I think it's canyon acid, it's kelp, salt, and native licked. Fed it all last winter, fed it all this summer. I get a treated case of pink eye. What is that? It's uh, I read the name, it's called KNS. It's kelp, salt, 
salt and native lick. Um, you can feed straight kelp is a lot more expensive than pay tax. And agrodynamics, they, they carry that product. Uh, but it, it was my day. I mean, treat powders pink on a little bit of fun. Uh, basically, every day to shoot, and after day two, they do what on, and it's a war to get shoot. So, um, that really helped a lot. The game went up, just everything was positive. Um, so, we got to provide these minerals. One of the other challenges is just to pay for work. Organics, a lot of records for inspected, for subject to surprise inspections. So, you got to be up to date one or two, and ready to, to justify what you're Fly control, there's our main fly control, blue boxes. Um, when we first started, like I said, I had Richards on part of the farm covered with blue bird boxes. And there was a lot less flies on that half of the farm than the other half of the farm. So uh, I went to look at the back of and said, here's 200 bucks of blue bird boxes. So they did, and we have them everywhere. Um, this is a shot looking down, and it's hard to see. But you look right there, that strip right there is a lot greater than the rest. Okay? That's that strip right there. Uh, Teddy was first off, said about he didn't think it was needed to rent big pastures, not big pastures. I used to think that. Now we renovate and I really think it's worth it. You know, he was, there's a stand that's probably been there for 30 years. And all I did here was graze that down. My hair real short. And uh, that was in the fall. I went there in uh, March with a new tip drill and added a green spirit and a new orchard grass and a new till daddy. And uh, it makes a world of difference. And what I like to do is we drill on space is I'll go ahead in here and see the clover coming, all frosty and clover in the fall of the year. And we have real nice dense big time. That stand right there, that would have been the two year old stand. And you can still kind of see the, the drill. When you first do that, you think you all may like a blue to an acre. But after they've grazed it two times, well, I really like to make hay first. You make hay and then you just grow with the green spirit. It's like a lot of pound, it gets a no brainer, it produces. The only downfall is on shallow soil that gets hot and does shut but also reacts to nitrogen. Okay. Did, you, did you say you put the clover on in the fall? No, I drilled it in the spring, let that go the whole year, make it in the fall and winter, I cross even clover. And that's usually, you know how it is, two to six pounds the acre. That's all fast power drop. <laughs> but yeah, I really think there's, there's value, you know, because I've done some back numbering and on these fields here all on prime soils we're usually right around seven top on that that grass. Um, I talked about artificial breeding it's a, it's a challenge. Um, there's a paddock here, a paddock here, a paddock here, and a paddock here and they're really small. Okay so what I do is right here's the house if I'm A9 the AI group is right next to the house. That way when Jen looks out the window. They never can tell you who's in here, okay? But they can tell you there's some ride going on down here. Get down and figure out who it is. It's called a green and green bread, okay? The first couple years we didn't do that. We had about 50% consumption rate on the first service, which is terrible. Uh, once we did this, we usually ran between 87 and 90% on the first service. Uh, so heat detection was very good. If you're going to do that, uh, you've got to have real good fences. You know, here I have an H-train fence, I'm just here when I block the place. But I still have holes to chop that fence. You'll see right down here in a little bit. He's 2,000 pound depth of wool, but he's very adamant to throw that eight bar fence and lots of pump brush. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, the majority of the fence in the farm, like I said, we build everything. This four strand fence on the outside. Inside, we get down to one strand, and I just break stuff off the ball. Um, I find that flexibility is very important. Um, Tom Cowder here mentioned about you know, using hay. 
pay the tool to bring parasites. That's a, a good deal. I want to hang or help bring that parasite cycle. So if I had these all in one acre permanent pastures, it would be a real pain to go in there and okay. But since they're big pastures working out of polar wire, you can go in there and make hay. Or lime. The other thing I do that most people don't is we put a lot of pen in the wall. I have a nutrient balance sheet. I know what my deficiencies are in probably every four years. In the fall, after we're done grazing, we cut the them off. And the advantage of that that I've seen is we soil test. And right now, these fields right here, uh, they have probably been grass. We've been on the farm since 2000, probably 20 or 30 years before that. I'm running just about 6% of the acre. And that's so cool because when I look over here, the neighbors are all brown. Guess who's still green? Just another shot. Um, this was reseeded. Last well, was received. This was received probably three or four years ago. That has been a little longer. Again, those are hay fields. I break down with uh, one strand high pencil, and I just break polywires off of that. Here's one here. I have water. Um, next slide is. Well, yeah, polywire we just break it down. There's another group on path where it's got the last break in that particular field. Uh, the problem I have in these five acre strips is the water in this case is the other end. So I can't run a back fence and that's hurt me. So what I need to do is run some water out there and these fences so I can run a back fence and you know, get the 50 feet and 50 feet, not 50 feet plus the 300 feet from this, four days. The, the regrace will hurt you. What we try to do to do that is you know, lump groups together so to cross that whole five acres and plus four or five acres. Trying to you know, eliminate that back raise. Alleyways are very important, especially for your, your artificial breeding program. Um, I either have uh, everything where the breeding group is, the younger apples, it's all part of that. So, so I can move the alleyway and move back and forth real quick. Treatment or breeding, or it's done. Um, we get to the bigger fields, the bigger herds, you know, let's just say herd, bigger cattle, bigger size. Uh, all, all the alloys are all temporary, all the wire. We do a system that they respect that. The water system uh, water comes from two wells on the farm. It's buried with a backhoe up to a hydro pump by the barn, pump by the house. In this case, there's a pipe that goes this way out to 16 acres. This one goes back here and water is 30 acres. What we did there um, to save some money, we, uh, Richard, my buddy, he had a John Deere subsoiler. We dropped the outside two shanks off, so we had one shank in the middle. Well, the steel pipe in the back of it, and I plowed my water system in. Um, we plowed a thousand feet of pipe in. Beats the heck out of the table of the hell. <laughs> okay. It's not totally freeze proof because I can have about 20 inches of that with the subsolver. So we're about 20 inches deep, so all I do is we'll drain everything out there. But you can do a lot of late fall grazing, early spring grazing if you want on 20 inches deep. Um, it's a really good way to do that. Uh, we do run some above ground. Had water above ground well, for about 15 years now. Again, as long as we drink that out, we got no real issues. We use either 75 or 100 gallon rubber made troughs. Um, when I first started this, you know, I tell people on out on farms, you can know, get one trough and move around. It's not that much work. I'll tell you what, try it once. <laughs> we do troughs one year, the next year, I bought 15 draws. Uh, moving draws is old quick. Um, one issue, we probably can't believe I do this, but you see the deer foot valve on there? I always say don't ever use those. They are we talk about water. For small size herds, they work fine. You have good reach on the train. Um, you get to bigger herds, you can do 
bigger flow valve that will pump more water through than that. These are partial flow valves, and no matter what I put to it, I'll get five gallons out of that flow valve. Um, as long as the cows can't drink back to five gallons, then I'm all right. If they do that, then this trough now becomes a football. You know, I'll come forward, the trough's knocked over, but I've never irrigated to it in the pasture. Um, so we've since going in, I've planted another post here. All I've done is run one strand of high tensile around there with a rack on. That's enough to keep them from that trough off the ground and playing football. Uh, this is a shot of one group on grass. Um, trying to show you there, these would be probably in the 20 month old the bread peppers. Um, that point for the last eight months, all these things. Now, I will say this, I don't like to stir up the Holstein versus Jersey controversy, but what I've seen, if I was going to milk cows, or any dairy cows, they would be Jersey. Um, just the frame size, of, especially these Holsteins, are hard to maintain, especially when you start milking them. Um, I see lots of hot days, and you can see we don't have many trees. Okay? Um, hot days, they're out there. Michael, well, yes, sir. Did you did you factor that into how you laid out your form, the breeds at all? At that point, I did. Um, Does that facilitated changes then in your layout? Yeah, that did make some changes. You know, especially when I started off, I didn't have many lane ones. Because like I said, I don't have that many trees, and I don't like local trees because they end up congregating. Congregating, you get a parasite like that. So if it's real hot, you know, and I'm unique because like I said, we're in Sarsen County and it is above 80, it, it's not for very long, okay. Um, I will look the lane ways up and they can go back to one of the barns for shipping. So do you do you make different allowances for in the barns based on the breed then, based on the size perspective? Yeah, I'll do that one. That's red right, bone, that's my Devon bull. Um, eight years old, but I won't put in the headlock. I was in very good deposition. Yes, a lot of guys with that is right there, but uh, we've got to put the bull now, and uh, he's the same way. So. Okay, the barn. I'm all about low cost, low input, and if you show me something once, I can do it. Okay. So I run all my whole barn myself, and this was all old pens. You know, Four foot wide horse with a horse, all that stuff. I brought the old timers in. I said, now which ones can I cut out of here? Which ones need to stay? They said, this, this, this. I got the chainsaw and skip that down the floor. Um, we have one, two, three pens this way. The shed part I have divided into two pens. So at that point, we have five pens. I made this. Uh, my first barrel was a four over three G Vermeer. It was four foot high, three foot wide. Great idea, small bale, except at the end of the day, we got 200 to pick up. It takes forever. So I went to a bigger baler. At that point in time, I could drop these bales right down that hole and, and put a week's worth of dry hay in there and feed once a week. Um, we elevated this floor up and worked very well. Now we have to roll until we get a small and put it down the hole. Hand facilities are a must. Um, the way I'm set up, there's a pan here. They, if I'm just one individual breeding, they come in here, they're right here, I slam this gate and turn them and shove them down through the shoe. Um, not the fastest, but it works. Okay? If I'm going to run the whole herd through, they'll actually come up through here, make the right, and we'll end up right here at this gate. And we kind of put some other gates in there, clear things out. Um, it works really good for heifers because it's a smaller shoot. There's no way in the world red men would ever go through that shoot in the big cows. So uh, for me, for I'm going to have to do a different, different setup or rip this out on a squeeze shoot. But I have very little money. Well, 800 bucks of this and I'm going to press. We all grew that barn, so I had to do something else. I went to a farm protective structure. Um, we closed one end in, this would be the, the storm end. 
came off 10 foot of steel. We have doors. Uh, this goes into the feed out, that goes into the cow. Up here, I just put shake away. So the air goes to the other end of it. There's an inside shot, pen in the back, pen up front, one water, and we feed bales in here and I'm all. Um, it's been great. That's probably seven or eight years. I've never had a sick out of the barn. <coughs> the air flows great in the back barn. You get 75 head in there, every story. Okay. All right. These things are cheap. Even with the post and the structure, the head gates and the water, I have less than $10,000 in that. And that's a 2100 square foot building. And again, I did the whole thing myself. But you can see, we, we've done pretty good. Uh, last couple slides. This here, when I got here, is the path here. It's where the streams are. Um, the stream comes down here, one here. We put it in the crowd. I know some of you probably think, well, why would we take that path and put it in the crowd? Get the last grades that, whatever. Um, we did it. This is 12 years later. The tree regeneration in that area. My deer stand right, right there. There's why I did it. Like I said, we're a, we're a tight family. We work hard together. But we also play hard together. He has a beagle, he has a bird dog, he loves to shoot deer. Every deer he shot has been somewhere in this area. There's no one watching the game commission can report me. The other day he shot six rabbits over there. So, uh, he has a lot of fun and we spend a lot of time together on And uh, to me that ground and that capacity for that man uses a lot more important than seven acres of water. That's all I had. Um, like I said, contract grazer left us get started, left me start to utilize my farm, left me start to build a new drink center. I had very little risk in it, and it left me to buy time to see where I want to go and where we want to end up. Um, we didn't plan on learning it, but it happened. And uh, so far, it's a lot of been about. We may not be that way forever, but for right now, it's it's uh, both pretty fast. Any questions? Do you know what your mechanic had of more people static in the location? It wasn't bad. It was around two percent. Okay. Again, I bought the farm and like it went through two years, three, two years, two cycles, I should say, of prep before that. Plus it was hay for five years, so it's been in grass a long time. Plows haven't seen that farm in a long time. Um, but yeah, just by grazing and adding a pen and roll, uh, we really raised our hay. Water runoff is significantly less. We have a lot less runoff. Um, one thing I will mention though, and I, I challenge you to come up with your pastures, I've noticed this. You know, here's your pasture, here's your fence. You get down on hands and knees, you want that ground level. Here's your pasture, here's your fence. Here's your pasture, here's your fence. I think we do have a lot more compaction in our pastures than what we realize. I don't And to follow that up, get a flag or soil for a price getting over here, you will already need the fence, and you will bury it. Like I said, that's that's a lot of things to get. That's your typical pasture. So, something to check out. About. That's livestock. Come back to that's livestock. Any questions? Have you ever had an instance with a bi calf? What's that? Now? With a bi calf? Have you ever had? A I haven't had that yet. Though. I went back to him some steers. It was kind of like a sad one for a guy. Okay. Keep him from October to December, August. Mm -hmm. Had some cattle and we got around the shots and we kept around the barn a lot. We got their second round of vaccination and started going to the bigger group and we had a train wreck. And now I'm, I think, 68 years, we buried 16. Uh, before we ear notched them and sent off, we did have a BI calf. And that calf was not, uh, 
notice where the sick he got vaccinated the day that we were working here. And uh, put him out and they were going to get where we had the bike pretty deep. We went from one load of cattle to we bought in deeper than two load of cattle. Yeah, when you're going back and one's too many. Yeah. I had one time we bought some feeder pig and I had we got the coal line and it came in with the pig and we traced it back and we had to lost all cattle. Just pretty much about the after that we didn't watch all the cattle on the ground. For our purpose. I mean we said we say it when we sell them. Yeah. It was for our purposes and all for the sell. Any other questions? Okay, the question is about grazing the cover crops. Um, I'm going to. I have one of the paddocks that had beans in last year, and one of the paddocks I had uh, corn. And because of the season, I was able to become a crop of So I have five acres of wheat, and I have four acres of rye. And uh, the rye got a real slow start. It's a lower soil. The wheat got a better start, so we're going to start on the rock. I think there's some real benefits to doing that. The other thing I want to try to do, we this year the first time we tried soaps of in grass, because the beef were grass finishing them. And I used to soak the in grass and bail as the grass finishing worked very really well. So I think after we get done with the wheat, we're gonna go ahead and put some soaps of in grass and try to break them down. Uh wheat. Just straight wheat. Well, this it was about the number first. Questions? Uh, if you could fill out that um, that survey there, uh, that would help us out. And uh, we just like to thank JB for uh, filling in and uh, having a good talk. Uh, I guess they like to give you some All right. berry and fruit jam from West Virginia Fruit and Berry. Thank you. What's the session name? What What'd you call this? Contract raising hours. There was another another session though that the speaker canceled out, so JB filled in. Um, I believe uh, we've got a short break, and then there'll be a uh, WVU program.